we're, we're live though, oh, but we're not. That's what I meant. Yeah, no audio, yeah. We are live, visually we're okay, live. Visually we're live. Okay, yeah. good. They can see all the mess I'm making here. <laughs> Otherwise, we don't come on at 11 o'clock. People think we're not gonna yeah. come on. Go someplace else. Okay, there you go. Okay. <clears throat> Wow, very good. All right, um, howdy, folks. Uh, Father God, in the name of Jesus Christ, thank you, Lord, for blessing us and saving us and loving us. Thank you, Lord, uh, that you preserved us here this day to hear your word. Thank you, Lord, for that. Uh, I thank you, Lord, that we just thank you, Lord. Father, we ask that you open the eyes and ears and hearts of our understanding that we may receive more of you this day, more understanding, more love in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. Amen. 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 Praise God. Praise God. Today's message is uh, one of these days I'm going to be given the last message I ever give. It may be the last message that you ever hear, too. This is about to all come to pass. Everything that's in the Bible is about to come to pass. Uh, so let me read you what's going to happen to you. It's going to be the set of these proclaiming of a great people and a strong. We're going to read about a great people and a strong. They're coming. They're be, how, many, how will I say? They're going to be made manifest. They're going to be made apparent. They're coming now. So let me just read you. There are two verses in the Old Testament that are, are really kind of neat that I, that I start with. That Joel chapter 2, verses 1 and 2. Now, Joel chapter 2, verses 1 and 2, have a whole complete story in themselves. So we're going to look at both those verses today, all right, one by one. So the first verse we're going to look at is Joel chapter 2, verse 1. Now, what I've done up here, I, I put underneath the, the, the voice of the Lord, captioned it, the voice of the Lord, capitalized it, but underneath it I have the two verses uh, right there so that you can refer back to them because the explanation gets a little complicated and you can get lost. So you can always refer back. Now we're going to deal with the first verse first. First, I'll read the two verses. Blow ye the trumpet in Zion and sound an alarm in my holy mountain. Let all the inhabitants of the land tremble, for the day of the Lord cometh, for it is nigh at hand. A day of darkness and of gloominess, a day of clouds and of thick darkness, as the morning spread upon the mountains, a great people and a strong, there hath not been ever the like neither shall be any more after it, even to the years of many generations. Now, that's a complicated deal, okay? All right, so let's look at this thing verse by verse, all right, and we'll see what the Lord's trying to tell us, because what we're trying to do here now, and the subtitle of this is the first verse, Joel chapter 2, verse 1, subtitled is, Your Preparation for the Day of the Lord, because the Day of the Lord is coming, and your we're concerned about your preparation. You're going to meet God. You're going to meet Jesus Christ. You're going to actually going to meet Jesus Christ. You're going to become, if you're a Christian, you're going to become one with Jesus Christ. If you're not a Christian, anyway, we'll read about it. This is Joel chapter 2, verse 1. I'll read it again. Uh, Blow ye the trumpet in Zion, sound an alarm in my holy mountain, let all the inhabitants of the land tremble, for it is nigh at hand. Now, so just, uh, we'll go back now and we'll read what's in there. First, it starts off with, with blow, so we'll go for the explanation. Uh, blow, in the Hebrew, that means sound. It means sound loudly. Well, that's what, a, when you blow a trumpet, you sound loudly, okay? Sound loudly, ye the, uh, blow ye the trumpet. Now, the trumpet is actually the shofar. That's called S-H-O-F-A-R. That's a horn. That's a ram's horn, all right? That's what they use for a trumpet. Uh, the, sh the shofar or ram's horn, that's what you're, you're blowing, okay? And it is God's horn because it's a ram. That's, the, that's a mature sheep, a sh mature lamb. A mature lamb is a ram, okay? Uh, blow you the ram's horn. That's God's horn. That's God's trumpet signifying, signaling, signifying to us. This is significant. When they blow the horn in the Old Testament, it was significant. Significant. So this is significant to you. So it says, blow the trumpet in Zion. Now Zion physically was the highest mountain in Jerusalem. 
Jerusalem is composed of several mountains, okay? Uh, and uh, the highest mountain is, is Zion. That was the, the, the uh, uh, place where uh, David, David dwelt eventually, okay? It's the, high, uh, how, the peak point. Uh, that's, that's physically. But spiritually, what is Mount Zion in Jerusalem? Well, spiritually, Mount Zion is a type and shadow of Mount Sinai. It's where God dwells, on the top of the mountain. On top of the mountain, in Mount Zion in the New Testament, uh, on top of the mountain, and Mount Sinai, Sinai in the Old Testament. That's where God dwells, okay? Well, where does God dwell, and what, and what? He dwells in the priests, the pastors, which are the shepherds of the congregation. That's where God dwells. God speaks from the priests, the pastors. He speaks from and through the priests and the pastors of the congregation. And what is the congregation then? Well, the congregation would be Jerusalem. All Jerusalem is a congregation, and within Jerusalem, the highest peak, the mountain, of, is the mountain of Zion. That's where, now look at it like this. All the sheep are in a flock all around, that's Jerusalem, and in the middle of it, standing higher than all the rest of them, is the shepherd, Mount Zion. You see it? So that Mount Zion and Jerusalem are, Mount Zion is the priest, the pastor, the shepherds, and, and Jerusalem is the sheep, all the people around it, all saved, all born again. And so that's the images that we're, we're, this is all connotating here, okay? So Mount Zion is physically the highest mountain in Jerusalem. Spiritually, it's the type and shadow of Mount Zion, which means it's the, uh, the priests, the pastors, the shepherds of the congregation. And what are the priests, the pastors, and the shepherds of the congregation? They are the voice of the Lord. The sheep go, bah, 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 and the pastors, the priests, and the sheep, they, they, they speak like I'm speaking to you now in a discernible voice, okay? So the pastors uh, in, in every congregation represent the shepherds, which represents the, uh, the priests, okay? Uh, those who do the speaking. And look at it from physically. All the sheep, and literally in the flock, wandered around going ba ba ba, and they were surrounding the shepherd who spoke. And the shepherd back 2,000, 3,000 years ago spoke and he led, led the sheep here, and he led the people the sheep there, and so on and so on. So now you get the realization of what God is talking about when he says, blow you the trumpet in Zion, sound an alarm in my holy mountain. That's all. That's Zion, Jerusalem, is the, is the holy mountain, okay? All Jerusalem. Now it doesn't say here, uh, uh, well here it goes on. It says, blow you the trumpet in Zion, sound an alarm in my holy mountain, that all the inhabitants of the land tremble. Now, wait a minute. You're not going to tremble. It's not talking about, it's talking about the land that is surrounding Jerusalem, which are unsaved people. Those people who are not sheep are on the outside of the flock. They're the unsaved people. Now we're talking about the unsaved people. He says here this, the sun alarm in all my holy mountain, that's us. And then in them, he says this, that all the inhabitants of the land that is parenthetically now, surrounding the holy mountain of Zion slash Jerusalem. That, is, that means, again, not the uh, holy unsaved people. We're not, uh, our, 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 our what? The land is, is the, uh, the, the, the not holy unsaved people. The land is the not willing to be saved people. That's what they are. Anybody who's not saved is not willing to be saved. You certainly get a lot of opportunity. Every time you go to see a pastor, if, if he's a real pastor, he's going to ask you, would you like to receive Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior? You certainly have opportunities, but if you're not willing, you don't get saved. Okay? Not holy. Okay? Not, not, as, uh, the not unsaved people of the Lamb, the not, uh, not willing to be saved people, not willing to receive Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior, which means that they're not willing to change because they know when you receive Jesus, there's change every time. What do you mean change? Not willing to be transformed. That's the change. Not willing. That means that these people who don't want to receive Jesus in the land, the inhabitants of the land, who, who are about to tremble, are not willing to be transformed. But what does that mean? Let's go to our first footnote here. Uh, footnote number one about transform. It says here, Romans 12, 1 and 2. And I'll read the blackface first. I beseech you therefore, brethren, 
by the mercies of God that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. And be not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind that you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. Let's look at what the interpretation here is. This is what, uh, this is what Paul is, uh, is saying now, okay, in the book of Romans. Romans uh, chapter 12, verse 1. I beseech you, that beseech means I implore you. I plead with you, actually, okay? Brethren, he's talking a fellow saved people, a fellow servants to Father. And what we are is we're servants to God, are we not? When you're saved and born again, you've become a servant to God. Okay. What, what does that mean? Well, it's like you are the clay and he's the potter, right? The potter forms the clay. You are the, you are the clay and he's the potter and you're serving the, the potter. You're serving, you're, you're serving Father God. I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you, that ye, Present your bodies. Now ye, who is he talking about ye? He's talking about you. You are a spirit. He's not talking about your body. I mean, in terms of uh, that's not you. When I speak to you, I'm not talking to your body. Your body doesn't, doesn't even understand me. I'm talking to you, your spirit that lives inside the body. You live inside a body. You are not the body. Never ever are you the body. Why? Well, you're invisible, aren't you? And the body is very visible and physical. You're not physical. You're not, you're not visible at all. You are an invisible entity living, a spirit living inside a body. That's who he's talking to, your spirit. He says here, by the mercy of God that ye, that is your spirit, uh, a spirit is like, like water temporarily living inside a body, a container, a container of clay. Well, when they make containers of, of like your cups, and they, that's a container. And inside, you put the water, right? Well, you're the water. That's spiritual as well. You're the water inside the clay. By the mercies of God that you present your bodies. Present means yield. That means give. Present. Yield. That he, God is saying, Paul is saying that, that, I, 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 I implore you, brethren, brothers and sisters, fellow servants to Father God, by the mercy of God that you, you yield your bodies, give your bodies a living sacrifice, wholly acceptable unto God. Now, wait a minute. How can you make your bodies a living sacrifice? Well, your body is, number one, your most, present, most precious possession, is it not? Do you own anything in this world that's more important than your body to you? You don't own anything more important than your body. That's the because that's keeping you around. That's your most precious thing. Well, what were you supposed to in the Old Testament? What did they sacrifice to God? They sacrificed their precious things. When you sacrificed a sheep, you didn't take just the old sheep in the flock. You took the best sheep, the most precious sheep, and gave it to Father God. When you sacrificed anything, you gave the best of it to Father God. Well, the best thing you got is a body temporarily. You have a body, okay? And it says here that you present your bodies, that is your most present, pre, pre, uh, pre, precious possession, a living sacrifice. Well, how can you present your body a living sacrifice? Well, what you do is you dedicate your body to serving God's, because you're a servant, are you not? To serving God's work. That's what Paul's saying here. I, I implore you to present your bodies, to yield your bodies, to serving God's work. What do you mean by serving God's work? Well, that's what these uh, staff members do. They come in and they volunteer to serve, that is, put their bodies in positions where the bodies are, are helping this person or this person, they're moving this thing, for, all doing God's work. You're presenting your body. My staff are presenting someone, well, somewhat reluctantly, may I add, are, <laughs> are presenting their bodies, however, a living sacrifice. They could be doing other things with their bodies. They could be out uh, laying around watching television or out uh, riding in a boat or a car someplace or doing this. They could be doing all kinds of things. But instead, they're presenting their bodies a living sacrifice. What does it mean? It literally means a dedicated sacrifice. Some more, some less. That's how it is. 
and some not at all. Some are just here on, on staff just to have a place to sleep uh, and to eat free food. And I know it. And some are here because God's here. Amen. And I know that too. Unfortunately, too few of them are here because of God. But most of them don't have any understanding in the first place. So what you do is you take people on staff, I take people out of the tool, out of the woods, so to speak, living homeless, and I bring them on church, on, on staff, to rehabilitate them, to bring them out of what they were in living in the world into something new, a new creature in Christ Jesus. And that's what we do here. We rehabilitate people. That's what salvation is all about. That's what the whole Bible is all about. That's what, that's what the whole thing, the whole deal is all about. Rehabilitation. From what you were, into What Y O U What do I put next here? Oh wait a minute now. Rehabilitation is from what you were into what you Well when you rehabilitate something you're restoring it. You're returning it back to its original position, right? So let me show you, what you what's becoming of you who are willing to allow it to happen. You are being real rehabilitated from what you were into what you are. Rehabilitate. Taking what you restoring is, is a restoration. It's returning you. That's what uh, Ecclesiastes 12, 7, favorite verse says, restoring you in the spiritual return to God who gave it. Restoring you back to what you were. Restoring you back to what you are. And what are you? You are an angel. You are a fallen angel and you're being restored if you're willing, back into becoming a new, a, a innocent angel once again. You're being restored. What did God lose? There's only one thing that God ever lost in the Bible. What did he lose? One thing. Angels. He didn't lose anything else, did he? Where does it say that God lost anything else? He lost angels. From where? From heaven. He lost them. Where did they go? Well, they came down to earth. Oh, oh. Well, what are you? You're a spirit. Spirits in the Bible are angels. Psalm 104, 4, and Hebrews 1, 7 says so. You're an angel. And you're being rehabilitated if you're willing to be rehabilitated. And if you're not willing to be rehabilitated, you're not going to be. And you're not going to go back to heaven. You're going to keep on going down with Satan. And where's he going to wind up in? A lake of burning fire. Oh, look what you got to look forward to if you're not saved. You got a lake, a burning lake of fire to look forward to. You're being rehabilitated from what you were to what you actually are. Were originally. How many to put it like this? Are, so it just clarifies it. For what you are originally. Because originally you were an innocent angel in heaven. Then you listen to that bad guy who was named Lucifer, a good angel, who turned to be kind of a new name, Satan. Anyway, let me continue now. I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, that means dedicated to God, serving God, perhaps in a place just like this, like Amy does here, for example, our nurse, serving God. Okay. Holy, acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. Why is that a reasonable service? 
Who wants to, who, God is your creator. Everybody, nobody will disagree that God didn't create you. Even the, the, the fallen angels are agreed about that. God created you. Well then, so what was, what do you, see, why, why did God create you? Nothing has ever been created without purpose. Because you have to think about it, and then you create it. That's what God did. He thought about it, and then he created it to what? To his purpose. That's you. You've been created for God's purpose, not your purpose. God's purpose. You've been creating your reasonable services to your creator, serving him for the purpose, his purpose, that he created you for. And because you're a fallen angel, now you stopped serving God. You started serving Satan and wound up coming back. Let me read this. Nothing was ever created without a purpose. Well, then tell me this. Ultimately, this is your life here. What is your purpose? You were created for, with purpose, God's purpose. Well, you're down here, so you decided not to go along with God's purpose. So, well, otherwise, if you were at all, I mean, this is an angel, you, you stayed up in heaven, uh, then you would still be doing God's purpose. But you didn't, you fell. You stopped doing God's purpose and decided to start doing Satan's purpose. So what do you think now, boys and girls? What's your purpose? You tell me. Ultimately, what's your purpose? Well, I'm just going to live in here and have a good time, and I'm going to go out and get drunk and get high, and I'm going to do this, that, and steal this if I want to, and that, and I'm going to... All these things you're going to do, that's your purpose? Well, good luck with that. Sorry, can't bless it. Good luck with that. Now, what's that going to get you, serving your purpose? <laughs> Your selfish purpose, not serving God, but serving your purpose. What do you think that's really going to get you? You're going to live forever? Is that it? Oh, yeah, I'm going to live forever, so I'm going to be high and high and this, and I'm going to do this and that thing, and do all these things because I want to do them, and I'm the boss, and I'm going to, yeah? You're going to do this? How long are you going to do this for? More. Another week, another day, another year, two years, maybe 20 years, maybe 100 years. Then what? Then what? Whoa. Down the tubes, buddy. Down the tubes. Because why? Because you're not serving what you were originally created for. And you were originally created to serve God, or he wouldn't have created you. God created everything to serve him. It's all his delight. It's, that's what Eden means, the Garden of Eden. Eden in the Hebrew means delight. Whose delight? God's delight. God created everything for his delight, his purpose. Are you serving God or are you serving you? Well, if you're serving God, then you're being deceived because you're actually just serving Satan and not knowing it. That means you're ignorant. Ignorant doesn't mean you're stupid. It just means that you are, don't know. Wake up. There's not a lot of time left. <laughs> Let me continue. Okay, uh, which is your reasonable service. And then it says this in, in verse number uh, 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 2 of uh, Romans uh, chapter 12. And be not conformed to this world. Now it's talking about not serving God. Whoa, how do you not serve God? Well, you become conformed to this world. What does conformed actually mean? Let me put my glasses on so I can tell you. <laughs> Conform means fashioned alike. In the Greek, it means fashioned alike. It means fashion yourself according to, to what? To this world. Is that what you're doing? Trying to conform to this world? All things, well, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to do this thing right, and I'm going to say this thing, and I'm going to, well, the world says to do this, as I say, I'm going to, uh, and be a big shot in the world. Because I was into that deal at one time. Big shot, own this, that, so on, so on. Big shot. And after a while being a big shot, you realize after a while it's kind of boring. And I thought, gee, there must be something else other than just this, which is, don't mean nothing. Oh, well, I was having a good time, but you know, even that repetition, after time, after time, after a while, gee, what's the purpose of all this? 
there was no purpose. Because that purpose was my purpose, which is no purpose. I was just having a good time. I thought. But I was having a lot of miserable time, too, the next morning. <laughs> That's when you have the bad time. Well, as my staff well knows. So, so he says here, which is your reasonable, reasonable service? That means service to the Creator who created you for His purpose, not yours. Nothing was ever created without a purpose. Does that make sense? Because to create something, you have to think about it. And if you think about it, the only reason you're going to create it is because you have a purpose, you have a reason for creating it. That's why you think about it. You create. So nothing was ever created without a purpose. God created everything for His purpose, for His delight. That includes you. Well, are you obeying God? Are you conforming to what God wants you to be? Or are you conforming to the world? It says, be not conformed, be made like, like the, this worldly thing, but be transformed, it says here. Transform, what does that mean? In the, in the Greek, that word is metamorphosos. Metamorphos, I can pronounce it metamorphos. It means to be changed, to be transfigured. God wants you to be transfigured. He wants you to be rehabilitated. Change. Change from party man to godly man. Change from party man to godly man. A lot of my staff doesn't understand that. They think that's just what we're doing. We're here, we got some opportunity to steal some stuff from God, which is what they're doing from the mission when they're stealing stuff to buy drugs. And then they're going out and getting drugs and party time. They think this is all party for them. Well, got news for you. Have a good time while you can, but you ain't going to have time, good time for the rest of your eternal life. You might be trying to enjoy yourself now, but that's just temporary, man. Eternally, you're going to pay for it. You're going to die and go to hell. Burning a lake of fire. That doesn't sound real good, does it? Burning a lake of fire. Ah, well, let's go on here. Say, huh? Okay, so that's why you should be, they need to be rehabilitated so that doesn't happen to you. By how? Okay, be ye, trans be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind. What does that mean, renewing? Well, the, the Greek word is renovation. Notice the re in front of it, R-E. That means return, made new again, okay? Becomes a, a synonym for renovation is be changed, uh, be transfer, uh, be, uh, oh, no, I'm sorry. Uh, a synonym for renovation is makeover, made over, overhauled, reconstructed, reformation, repaired, restored. All these re's in front means going back to what you were. Doesn't mean brand new things again. A lot of people say, oh, it's all gonna be brand new. Never been there. No, 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 never say you are a spirit. You were perfect at one time. Every person here was perfect at one time. Every spirit here, I should say, was perfect at one time. But you're not perfect anymore because you followed Satan and his lies. We got a typification of that happening in our public domain right now. Nationally, Satan is leading this whole country down the tubes, destroying it methodologically, perfectly, every single time. And we've all walked around scratching, well, why, why is this happening? Oh, well, why is that happening? Well, why is that happening? It's because you're being destroyed, you idiots. Don't you see it? That's incorrect. I shouldn't call you idiots. You're not informed because you've not been paying attention. Unawares. My bad. Unawares. This is what's happening to you and you don't even know it. It's like the frog, the live frog that you take and you put them in cold water and on top of the stove. Then you turn the, the burner on underneath a little bit, just a little bit, and as it continues to warm the water, the, 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 the frog doesn't know the difference. 
It just keeps, I think it's okay. And the water gets hotter and hotter and hotter. And the frog acclimatizes to that, gets hotter. And finally, the frog just gets cooked. And you're all done. That's what's happening to you. You're all frogs in the water. Listening to the wrong stuff. Oh, yeah, but I like my beer. I like my, my uh, uh, drugs. And I like to, yeah, well, just. <laughs> it's like somebody's telling me, oh, I like smoking cigarettes. <laughs> well, you know, I used to like smoking cigarettes too until I started to cough on that. And I thought, it's a dirty, a dirty, disgusting habit. And I said, I want to quit. I don't like this. But I kept on smoking. I don't like this. I smoked, and then I was smoking one after another. One after, well, who was in control? I wasn't in control. My spirit was in control of something else. My goodness, what could that possibly be? Well, the Bible tells us that's called a demon. That's called an unclean spirit. It's called a fallen angel. I was in control of a fallen angel who wanted to destroy me, and how he was doing that, he continued to have me smoke. And through the Lord, I overcome that. I used to swear all the time. Even now, I occasionally notice I once in a while swear. I used to swear every sentence. I was in construction, okay, with construction people, so that's how you talk. You, you swear, every sentence has got a swear word in it, sometimes two. And that's what I was consistently doing all the time. I got saved, I got born again, about two weeks afterwards, I was talking, and I, I came to, wait a minute now. I said all that stuff, and I didn't swear one time. How come? God did it. God changed me. I didn't swear. So I went from being a guy swearing profanity all the time to a guy not, how do I say, almost perfect. No, I'm not perfect. Every once in a while, even now, I'll let off with something. But... A whole bunch different than what I used to be. Because I'm being rehabilitated by God. He's working in me. So me. I'm being rehabilitated by God. I'm being changed. I'm being transformed from what I used to be into what I am becoming. And so are you if you're saved and born again. And if you're not saved and born again, none of that applies. And be not conformed to this world, but be transformed. Transformed from what? From a caterpillar into a, a butterfly. By a good analogy, I'll do that again. What is a caterpillar? A caterpillar is this greasy, slimy thing with all kinds of little bitty legs who's always walking around with his head on, on toward the ground, right on the ground, because he's looking for food all the time. Greasy, greasy slimy little thing. What happens to a caterpillar? Well, he comes around in the woods and he sees a tree, and he goes past by it, and he sees another tree, and pass, they go to the tree, and he decides to go up. That's called the cross. The cross, the cross made out of wood. He goes up the tree, so he starts climbing up the tree. Little by little by little by little by little. And then, once he's up some, some certain point, he attaches, he attaches himself to the tree. The tree attaches him. It was a cocoon around, a cocoon. The tree itself builds a cocoon of safety, of security around the caterpillar. And inside that cocoon, what's going on? He's being changed. He's being transformed. He's being rehabilitated into what? Into a butterfly. And one day, that cocoon breaks, that's your body, breaks, and out comes your spirit as a butterfly. Notice that the butterfly never goes back and touches the ground. He just flies up into the skies, into heaven. A beautiful, beautiful thing. That's what's happening to you who are being rehabilitated. And if you're not being rehabilitated, you're still a greasy old caterpillar crawling around on the ground. Well, good luck to you. Hope you find a tree. <laughs> but you, but being, being renewed, uh, I said, by the renewing of your mind, what is it here? It says here, but be ye transformed by the renewing <laughs> of what? How do you get renewed of what? What are we renewing? Of your mind. What's your mind? It's your thoughts. 
okay, I'm going to take a knife and I'm going to cut into this, this man's head and get his thoughts out of there. Well, gee, what are you going to do? Where are you going to find the thoughts? See, that's your spirit. That's the invisible you. That's supernatural. What other supernatural things can you actually prove right there? That's a supernatural thing. You have an invisible entity living inside of that body. Man, that's called supernatural. Tell me supernatural doesn't work. It certainly does. It works for you. It works on you. By the renewing of your thoughts that you may prove that is discerned or is a good and acceptable and perfect will of God. So let's go back up to this thing when we started here and it says in, in the text that all the inhabitants of the land tremble because that's what you should do. If you're, not being, if you're not saved and born again, if you're not being changed, transformed, you should better be trembling. You better be scared, st really scared because it's about to happen. The day of the Lord is about to come, okay? Okay, it says tremble. What does that mean, tremble? It means to quiver and that means any violent, that's in the Hebrew, any violent emotion uh, especially with anger or fear, be afraid, uh, the inhabitants of the land, be afraid, quake, rage, shake, 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 you're going to be shaken. That's in uh, Hebrews 12, verses 26 and 27, talks about the whole world, the whole universe is going to be shaken. The world, this world and the heavens are going to be shaken. And only that which is unshakable will remain. That's your spirit. Your spirit. The rest of you, that all the inhabitants of the land tremble for the day of the Lord cometh. The day of the Lord. Well, what does that mean, the day of the Lord cometh? That's, a, that's a, the thousand year millennium about to come. Wait a minute, let's look at footnote number two. What do you mean by that, the day of the Lord, a thousand years? 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 8, footnote 2. But beloved, be not ignorant, that's unaware. It doesn't mean stupid. It means unaware. Nobody's stupid. Nobody's an idiot. I'll take that all back. I just, my, my own, uh, my own <laughs> selfishness, I guess I said that. But you're unaware. That's why you're here. That's why I'm a teacher. I'm trying to teach you because you're unaware of things, okay? But beloved, be not ignorant of this one thing, that one day is with the Lord as a thousand years. That means to us it's a thousand years, but to him it's one day, and a thousand years as one day to the Lord. So the Lord, God, one day is a thousand years. So it could be like that. And maybe not. So let's go back here to say what it says here. Uh, let all the inhabitants of the land tremble, for it is nigh at hand. No, uh, tremble, and I have here in, in, in the red. Uh, for the day of the Lord cometh, and it is nigh at hand. That's when Jesus Christ returns for his saints. The day of the Lord. All right, so that's just verse 1. So the, the, verse, the whole verse read like this. So you look up on top and read it. Blow the trumpet in Zion and sound an alarm in my holy mountain. Let all the inhabitants of the land tremble, for the day of the Lord cometh, and for it is nigh at hand. Near, that means near. That means very near. Very near. So now let's go to the second verse. Second verse reads Joel chapter 2, verse 2. It's going to be a day of darkness and gloominess. A day of dark. A day, excuse me, a day of clouds and of thick darkness, as the morning spread upon the mountains, a great people and a strong, there hath not been ever the like, neither shall be any more after it, even to the years of many generations. Well, that's kind of complicated when you think about it. So let's just look and see what that, that means here on, this, on the, the second uh, uh, titled, uh, The Day of the Lord. Joel chapter 2, verse 2, looking at for the interpretation. A day, now we're going to talk about for all the unsaved people. And if you're unsaved, it's talking about you. For all the unsaved people that you may know, okay? And it's going to be a day of darkness and of gloominess, a day of clouds and of thick darkness. Now let's go back and look at that. It's going to be a day of darkness. Darkness in the Hebrew word means this, the dark. It means figuratively. It's going to be a day of misery, destruction, death, ignorance, sorrow, and wickedness. Wow, how'd you like that? For the unsaved. What's it going to be for the unsaved? Figuratively, misery, destruction, death, ignorance, 
sorrow, wickedness. It comes from Genesis chapter 1, verses 1 through 3. Don't mess with her, let her sit down or leave. Please sit down. Let's look at Genesis. This is referring to darkness refers back to Genesis chapter 1, verse 3. Okay. Sorry. You're okay. <laughs> In the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth, and the earth was without, without form and void, and darkness was upon the face of the deep. And the Spirit of God moved upon the face of the waters, and God said, Let there be light. And there was light. Wow. Genesis, the first three, three verses in the Bible. What, is it, what could that possibly mean in the Hebrew? Let's look and see now again. In the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth, and the earth was without form and void. Now, I won't get into what all those mean, but we're looking for darkness now. And darkness was upon the face of the deep. Face, now that's a term used in anthropomorphism. It's a, that's a term. That's a, a, a literary term, anthropomorphism. It means attributing human characteristics to something that's not human, okay? So what they're doing is, they're or, or vice versa, but anyway, they're making something human out of something that appears not to be human. So let's look and see what this says again now. And the earth was out form and void, and darkness was upon the face. See, it really says day. It didn't say on the covering of the deep. It said the face of the deep. And the deep in the Hebrew is, is a vast water, a source of water, okay? And the Spirit of God and the Spirit of God is what? The Spirit of God is God's thoughts. That's your Spirit. It's God's thoughts. That's called the Holy Spirit. What do you think the Holy Spirit is? It's all God's thoughts. All God's thoughts that he's manifested. All God's manifested thoughts, to put it like that, okay? And the Spirit of God moved upon the face of the water, which says face again, because it's emphasizing the humanity, not the humanity, but the like, like humanity-ness of this, okay? And the, and the Spirit of God moved upon the face of the waters. And what they really are saying here now, it moved upon the face of the fallen angels. Why did, it, why did the Spirit of God move upon the face of the waters? See, God has a purpose in everything, doesn't he? Now, why would you think that God would move upon the face of the waters? And we're talking about the, the, the waters being, uh, it said here, a darkness, uh, there were darkness, uh, misery, destruction, death, ignorance, sorrow, and wickedness. Why would God move upon something like that, the face of the waters, having those characteristics? Why did he do it? For healing. For healing. God moved upon the face of the waters, that's the fallen angels, that's you, for healing. For healing. What do you mean? Well, uh, well, well let's, how does that go here? Well, let's see the beginning and see if that makes sense if we look at it, the whole thing. And God said, let there be light. Now, what does light mean in the Hebrew? It's illumination in every sense, including happiness. Wait a minute. What were these things? What were the characteristics of this, this darkness? Again, it was uh, misery, destruction, death, ignorance, sorrow, and wickedness. Not good stuff. But God moved upon the face, moved upon these things for healing, and he said, let there be light. That's illumination, the opposite of darkness, illumination in every sense, including happiness. And there was light. Now, what does light actually mean? It means illumination in every sense. Okay, and it says here, let there be light, and there was light. Illumination in every sense, including happiness. Who, what does that mean? Well, listen, you know what Jesus Christ said in the New Testament? This is what it means. It means this. Jesus Christ said, I am the light of the world. Wait a minute. And God moved upon the face of the world. This is the, the, the world was, was, had all darkness and misery and uh, destruction, death, or whatever. And God said, let there be light. And Jesus Christ said, I am the light of the world. What did he come for? Jesus Christ came for our healing. To get rid of all that garbage that we had. The darkness that we're living in as unsaved people. All that, all that evil is, is being gone. He's being healed. Jesus came for the healing. He's the light of the world. He's the light that came out of that darkness. And God said, let there be light. And there was light. Wow. See how that ties in? And he said, I'm the light of the world. And the light in the Greek, that means the cosmos, the universe. 
And that's found in John chapter 8, verse 12. And again in John chapter 9, verse 5, it's talking about Jesus Christ. I am the light of the world. Okay, so now what we've just learned is that God created Jesus, if you want to look at it like that, in, right in the beginning of the Bible, in verse 2. Let there be light, and there was light. But there was Jesus Christ. Happiness. Do you want happiness or do you want to be miserable and uh, going through all the garbage things and darkness that you're used to be doing all your life until you get saved? So going back now, and, and, and so Joel chapter 2, uh, for, uh, for all the unsaved people, uh, it was, it's, it's a, the day of the Lord is a day of darkness. And that means misery, destruction, death, ignorance, sorrow, wickedness, because they're not been healed. They don't have Jesus. And what else is it? And of gloominess. Gloominess? What do you mean that? In the dictionary, gloominess means despair, dismal, depressing. Well, if I had all those characteristics in me, misery, destruction, death, ignorance, sorrow, and wickedness, I'd be a little depressed too. <laughs> and you know what? A lot of people come into this rescue commission are exactly that. They are depressed. Severely depressed. You would be too if you are living underneath a tree and had to come to the mission to get something to eat, didn't have a nickel in your pocket, and you were addicted to coke and cocaine or, or amphetamines or, or whatever it is, you'd be a little depressed too. Because you got to know you're addicted. That means you got to know that you're not in control of yourself. Something else is. How do you like walking around feeling that something else is in control of you? Because it is. And his name is not Jesus Christ. His name is Satan. Be a day of darkness and of gloominess. A day of clouds. Now in the Hebrew, a cloud means covering the sky like the nimbus or the thundercloud. It comes from the root word which means to cover over, to act covertly. That's hidden, subtly. Practice magic, enchanter, sorcerer. Things are going on that we cannot see, but we know they're there. Thick darkness, that means at the, okay, well, we'll just stop there. That's where it stops. See, this is one, one verse, but now what happens is big time change right here. Right in the middle of the verse, it changes. It's going to change from a day of darkness to a change of light. Here's how. What it says then. Okay, the end, it says the, the first part, the bad stuff says this. A day of darkness and of gloominess, a day of clouds and of thick darkness. That summarizes an unsaved person. Now, we're going to look at the saved person in the same, same verse. As the morning spread, uh, spread upon the mountains, and the morning in the Hebrew is light, as the light, remember the light, what that is, spread upon the mountains, mountains uh, enlightening, that means lightning, enlightening the darknesses of pride. As the morning spread upon the mountains, a, people, a great people and a strong, oh, nowhere else in the Bible does it say that. That we're going to become a great people and a strong. We, yes, you, you who are saved and are born again, are going to become a great people and a strong. Well, what does that mean? In the Hebrew, uh, strong means, it means powerful, it means mighty. Okay, now we look at this, what Jesus said. He said, I have, I have chosen you. In, in John uh, 15, 16, he said, you have not chosen me. I have chosen you. Selected. Jesus Christ selected you. He's the light of the world, and he selected you. Selected you what? To be saved, to be born again. Or you wouldn't be here. Quite frankly, you'll be home watching television or sitting underneath a tree someplace or, or out there doing whatever, getting whacked out with, your, with drugs when you wouldn't be here. He selected you to be, and who is it? He's, he's talking now about a great people and a strong. There hath not ever been the like. Oh, what do you mean there's not ever been the like? That's right. Okay. Well, what do you mean? Let's just let's see what those people are like. These are the people of the first resurrection. You find that in Revelation chapter 20, verses 5 and 6. That's the saints. 
the saints, the born-again people, are going to be part of the first resurrection at the beginning of a thousand-year millennium. At the beginning of a thousand-year millennium, they're going to be the first part, first part of it, okay? And, and, and there hath not ever been the like, ever been the like, neither shall be any more after it, after it means uh, a parenthetical now for a period of time until the great white throne. First, second, Revelation 20, we have, we have the first resurrection. And then it goes through some verses, and then the last thing we have in Revelation 20 is the great white throne judgment, which is the second death. The second death. Not the first death, the second death. Let's go on this now again. time until the great white throne is completed that's revelation 20 verse 11 even to even till even until the years of many generations what's going to happen to these people these great people the strong here it is during which time the resurrected saints that's christians will preach and teach and renew the minds of many. That's what you're going to do. For a thousand years, you're going to preach and teach and renew the minds of many. Renew from, uh, from uh, Romans 12, 2. That's for who? That's for those people who get resurrected in the first resurrection. That's the Christians, okay? And it says here, a great people and a strong. They're not ever have been the like. In other words, that's never been happened before. This is the first time ever. You're going to go through the first resurrection. Now let's look and see. Let's see uh, uh, the second footnote here on the back, Revelation 20, verse. this is talking about the first resurrection. Revelation chapter 20, verses 4, and four through 6. And this is the first resurrection that the Christians will go through. And I saw the thrones, and they, that's the great people and strong, Joel chapter 2. I saw thrones, and they, this is a, a, a John speaking, okay. I saw thrones, and they sat on them, and that's uh, great people and strong, and judgment was given unto them. That's us. Judgment was given unto them. What do you mean judgment was given unto them? Look, look at footnote A here, right underneath that. Go down to footnote A from 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 2 and 3. Do you not know, it says here, do you, did, do you not know that the saints shall judge the world? That's cosmos. That means the universe. That's, a, that's in Greek. Do you not know that the saints shall judge the world? And if the world shall be judged by you, by you, are ye unworthy to judge the smallest matters? Know ye not that we shall judge angels? Now it says angels here. Now let me ask you a question. Think about the sense of this now. Talk about us. How are we going to judge angels? Angels are innocent, aren't they? Ah, not all of them. Fallen angels are not innocent at all. That's the ones we're going to judge. Fallen angels. Unsaved people. Unsaved people. Knowing not that we judge angels, how much more things that pertain to this life? You see what we're talking about here? We're talking about a great people and a strong. And we're going to judge angels. Now, the Bible said that. I didn't make that up. There it is. Now, if it's a lie, it would throw the whole thing away. It's just wasting my time and your time, too. But I don't think it's a lie. I think God's talking to us. Let's go back up to this footnote, too. And I saw thrones, and they, as a great people and a strong, that, uh, sat upon them, and judgment was given unto them. And I saw the souls of them that were beheaded for the witness of Jesus. That's coming now, incidentally for beheaded for the witness of Jesus and for the word of God. We're beheaded because you're a Christian. 
and which had not worshipped the beast, and the beast in the, in the Greek is a dangerous animal, a venomous wild beast, and which had not worshipped the beast, it's a type and shadow of the leading, how will I say, person in, uh, the uh, leading person in control at that time, which we call the beast. Whoever that might be, you might have a suspicion about that. We should not worship the beast, neither his image, an image means his likeness, his representation, neither had received his mark upon their foreheads. Wait a minute, upon their foreheads means uh, in, in, in their, most, their, their foremost thoughts received his mark. Was the mark. We're not sure what that mark is. It could be like a shot, or it could be like an actual imprint or a tattoo. It could be any number of things, okay? Well, we have been seeing a great emphasis upon getting shots this last year and a half or so. Great, great, extraordinary emphasis upon getting shots. So we mention that to you. Okay, neither his image, neither had received his mark upon their foreheads or in their hands. That means in their works, in, their, in what they do. And so what you do is important because you haven't received the mark of the beast in your works, in your, in your hands. That means what you do. In other words, what do you do? Do you go out and you rob and steal and cheat and lie and uh, get drunk, whacked out all the time? Is that what you do with your body? Not dedicated to God? If you do that, then that's you. You're already part of the beast. You need to come out of it. They just can't. They just can't take it. <laughs> they just can't take it. And that's the word of God. The word of God falls upon ears, fallen angel ears. They just, after a while, they just can't take it. They have to go someplace. You sit down. Yes, sir. Excuse me. They have to leave. You notice that? Now, if you ever notice in any congregation, who does the leaving? And you can already tell who doesn't want to hear the word of God. Because if they wanted to hear the word of God, they would stay, would you? Now, some of you are staying because you think you have to, and you do, okay? But others, even my own, uh, how influence is not enough to keep them, they leave anyway. Because they don't want, can't, they can't bear hearing the word of God. You need to think about what's happening around you. And, and receive his mark upon their foreheads. That's their foremost thoughts are in their hands. And that's talking now about those who are, are, are the uh, chosen people strong. And they lived and reigned with God, with Christ, a thousand years. Lived and reigned is, and I quote now, as kings and priests. That's from Revelation chapter 1, verse 6, and, and Revelation 5, verse 10. That means kings is secular and priest is spiritual. We're going to be. Reigning. No, not with a prideful, hey, I'm the boss now, I'm the king kind of a thing. No. Okay, it's in love. Love is a different deal. Right? Love is sacrificial. But love is just and it's righteous. And it's also going to be law for those who are unsaved. And that's really not good for them, too, because the law will get you if you're unsaved. That's all the Old Testament. But, and it says here, the devil will live and reign with Christ for a thousand years. We will. But the rest of the dead, the rest, that means all the rest of the dead, when Jesus comes, he's going to separate the lambs, or excuse me, separate the sheep from the goats. The sheep are all going to go up with Jesus, and uh, the goats are going to go to hell. Two different ways of thinking. Okay. And here's what's going to happen now. It says here in this now. Okay. And the, but the rest of the dead, that's, uh, that's the remaining uh, of, the, of the dead, live not again until a thousand years were finished. They didn't get to go into the first resurrection because they're not saved and they're not born again. So they lived again, not, they lived not again until a thousand years were finished. So they, but they, they were resurrected when a thousand years were finished. And here's what happens. It says what happens to us is the first resurrection. 
Blessed is holy is he that hath part in the first resurrection. On such the second death, which is the second resurrection, hath no power. But they shall be priests of God and of Christ, and shall reign with him a thousand years. Now let's look at this third footnote here. Let's see if I. So what will happen? Again, let me just read this here. I'll go back to the bottom of Joel chapter two, verses two, and it says here, uh, uh, even to years, uh, uh, there hath not ever been to talk about. A great people and a strong, there hath not been ever the like, neither shall be any more after it, and even until the years of many generations. Now, I have here as a commentary, many generations from the beginning, that's the first resurrection, until the second death, that's the end of a thousand year millennium, during which time the resurrected saints, as Christians, will preach and teach and renew the minds of many. Now let's look at the second resurrection. But don't number three. Revelations chapter 20, verses 11 through 15. And I saw a great white throne, and him that sat on it, from whose face the earth and the heaven fled away, that's the present earth and the present heaven fled away, and there was found no place for them, no place for them, no place for the unsaved. And I saw the dead, small and great, Stand before the Lord. Now we're just looking and we're judging, but we're not part of this people standing up. And I saw a small great stand before the Lord, and the books were open. Now that's interesting. And the books were open. Now let me just take a moment to put that up on the board because that's interesting. The books, why were the books? What's the books all about? The books were open. It says that there, okay, and the, and the books were open, and another book was open. Oh, and there's another book. Okay, so the books were open. And there's another book. Well, let's see what this, what's going on here. Let's clarify this thing. And the books are opened, and another book was opened, which is the book of life. Oh, this one here now is another book was, is the book of life. Wait a minute. So now we have two things here, two different things. We have the books, plural, and we have the book. Which one will you be judged out of? Oh, what's it say here now? Let's go further now, let's see. It says here, the books were open, and then they were judged out of those things which are written in the books, plural, According to their works. Oh, but remember, they weren't working for God. Okay, they're working for themselves. They were doing their own thing. They were doing wine, woman, and song like I used to do. Okay, they were having a good time. And the sea gave up the dead which were in it, and death and hell delivered up the dead which were in them. And they were judged every man according to their works. Oh, every man according to their works. That is recorded in the books, in the books plural. So the books plural are all the deeds that you've done and things you've done and thoughts you've had as a fallen angel. And the book singular It's the book of grace. It's the book of forgiveness. 
and the books uh, plural are sins. Because everything that you've done, the Bible says in the Old Testament, all your righteousnesses, all the things that you've done that you think are right are godly, all your righteousnesses are as filthy rags before the Lord. Filthy rags before the Lord. Because you're not saved. All your righteousness is, not God's righteousness is, not working for serving God, that's not going to, that's not uh, bad. But the things that you're doing, not being saved, useless. I, if I have someone coming into this rescue mission, helping me every single day, just doing this thing and that thing and really being a nice person and everything else, and they're not saved, they're not born again, they're just doing it for their own uh, uh, estimation. They're not going to, they're not saved. You've got to ask Jesus Christ to be your Lord and Savior to get saved. That's it. That's the only way. Jesus Christ said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. I am the only way. And death and hell were cast into the lake of fire. Now look at the list. This is the second death. Now watch this last line. And whosoever was not found written in the book of life, that means not, not found imputed for righteousness, as this, throughout the Bible that God did that, he looks upon the heart for righteousness, or not saved, not born again. Whoever was, was not found imputed for righteousness, saved, or born again, was cast into the lake of fire. Are you a lake? No. <laughs> what is that? Well, hey, I have a quote from Matthew chapter 25, verse 41. The lake of fire is everlasting fire prepared for the devil and his angels. Now, let me ask you a question here. Prepared, I think it's prepared as purposed, right? So God made a pur had a purpose when he crea we created the, uh, the lake of fire. Okay? Everlasting fire prepared as purposed for the devil and his angels. Well, who are the devil's angels? They don't believe Jesus Christ is their Lord and Savior. They believe in Satan. Or they just don't believe, period. What's going to happen to the people who don't believe in Jesus Christ as the Lord and Savior? That's the only th that's, that's what's going to be cast into the lake of fire. Where do you think the people are going to go to die who are not saved and born again? Right there, lake of fire. There's going to be a separation. Either go to heaven or you go to lake of fire. Your choice. Your choice because you have a choice still while each one of you is alive to ask Jesus Christ to be your Lord and Savior. You have that choice right now. To ask Jesus Christ to be your Lord and Savior and save yourself from the lake of fire. Lord means kurios in the Greek, it means supreme in authority. You're asking Jesus Christ to be your supreme. That word, and I'll tell you what else does that mean here. Look at how far that goes. This book, John 1, 14, explains it. And the Word of God, no, it says that, it says that, it says the Word. And the Word was, was made flesh and dwelt among men, and we beheld his glory, the glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. The only begotten of the Father, Jesus Christ. Metaphorically, this is Jesus Christ. What had happened? What, had, what did Mary do? Mary and Martha were, were given uh, a dinner uh, at their house for all, all the uh, uh, disciples, okay? And while Martha was running around doing things, and that's good, because she was getting things prepared for the dinner, like coming here and helping on the mission commission, and so on and so on. What was, what was Mary doing? Well, she was sitting at the feet of Jesus. Now, Martha was running around this, that, doing all kinds of stuff, and she saw Mary, her sister, sitting at the feet of Jesus, listening to Jesus. And she, she said to Jesus, well, hey, how come you don't, why don't you send her over to help me uh, do all the stuff that I'm doing? She stuck like a reasonable request, right? Except that Jesus said, ah, let her be, for Mary hath chosen that good part. Now, chosen that good part means the whole thing, what Martha was doing and Mary, was godly. But Mary had chosen the good part. What's the good part? Sit at the feet of Jesus. What is Jesus? He's this Bible. And when you sit down to read, you're sitting at the feet of Jesus. 
listening to Jesus. That's the good part. That's the good part. He said, let her be she has chosen that good part. Why? Because, and the Lord, Jesus put it a different way. He said also to his disciples, I call you no more servants. Because cause the servant doesn't know, uh, how I say, I'm paraphrasing, doesn't know, doesn't know the ways of the Lord. He just serves. Like and my staff, if I have someone who I say, do this, they go and do this. And that, then they don't do anything else. They wait for the next order. And I say, go do this, and they go do that. That's good. They're doing what they're supposed to do. All right, that's good. It's serving. I call you no more servants, but I call you friends. He said that. Jesus said that. I call you friends because you know the ways of the Lord. Oh, in other words, he can let you, you're his friend. He can let you go out and do what you want and trust and know that you do the right thing. But if you're a servant who just does what you're ordered to do, ah, servant doesn't know. Gets up there, has no idea what's going on, what's next, okay, and what they should do. Servant can, cannot act independently, but a friend can act independently and still be trusted by the Lord. What do you want to be? First thing off, you want to be saved and born again. These are all saved and born again people, servants and friends, okay? So they're all saved and born again. Now, do you want to be God's servant and serve God for all eternity in, in heaven? And that's great. God's looking for Martha's. Looking for people who run around and do this thing and that thing and help here and put this thing here and pray with this person and lead this over here. Those are marches, okay? Running around doing the good things. And then there's Marys. What's Mary? What are the Marys doing? They're reading the Word and studying the Bible. They're talking to Jesus directly. There's your choice. If you're saved and born again, what do you want to be? You want to be Martha? Or do you want to be Mary? Now, I've chosen Mary, and you've chosen whatever you want to be. But he said, Mary has chosen that good part. He said, they're both good, but this is a little bit better, if you could, in, in that sense of the word. Both holy, both good, but studying the word is a little bit better. Well, that makes a difference. They're sheep and they're shepherds, right? Same thing. The sheep are going to heaven because they obey the shepherd. That's what sheep do. They obey the shepherd. They go where the shepherd says. He leads them here. He leads them there, so forth and so on. They obey him. They support the shepherd with their, with their coat. In fact, all around here, I've told you before, this is a tabernacle of Moses, horizontal. Let's look at it vertical and put it up this way so that this part is stacked up in the sky and you have this section here. And this, this is all white fence all around. White fence. What color are sheep? You know what this, this word, uh, this is a word for size. You know what it means in the Hebrew? It means mouth. Mouth. Bad, bad. The word of God. Bad, bad. All the sheep, word of God. Okay? That means mouth. Okay. Then, from, this is the gate. This is the neck. And from this, this section here and this section here of the fence are each called shoulder. Shoulder, shoulder, neck. This goes down to these boards over here are called in the Hebrew ribs, ribs, ribs on that side, ribs on that side. And behind this, this corner here, this corner here is another board that's called thigh in the Hebrew. Thigh. This thing stands up. This is us. Here's the shepherd. Here's his shoulders. Here, shoulder here. That's his neck. Okay. This is his body. This is the ribs, ribs. And these are the sheep around him. White fence around him, the sheep around him. And the Bible says, because this is standing up now, and I think it's, he's, it's uh, I forget, Ezekiel, I think, 14, something like that, where it is the, the uh, body of dry belly, the dry bones, uh, and they're going to stand up. They're going to stand up. Oh, if this horizontal thing stands up, then we're waiting, all we're waiting for is the head. And the head's coming down to meet us standing up. This tabernacle is not going to be horizontal. It's going to be vertical, standing up. And the, he, Jesus in heaven is going to come down and meet his the head. He's going to be attached to us right here. I don't have any room for that. 
Well, I can't do it that way. Okay, completely, the white fence completely encloses. This is a shoulder here and a shoulder here. This is standing up, this, this here, and this is the inside, all vertical. And Jesus Christ is going to be the head coming down to meet the body, rising up. Rising up? What does 1 Thessalonians uh, uh, 4, 17 say? To meet the Lord in the air. Then in Christ shall rise, rise first, and then we which are alive and remain shall rise, go, go up, be caught up together with them to meet the Lord in the air. The Lord's coming down to meet us right there, and this is his ribs, ribs, that's a thigh there, and a thigh there, legs. And these are the sheep around the shepherd. Mouth. That's you. That's all in the Bible. It's all in the Bible. You see, without doubt, the supernatural exists. Now, I brought up the thing all oh, supernatural, all oh, that's a bunch of garbage, it's just over and so on. But it did, because I didn't realize that, that it's right inside me. I got a, a supernatural entity living right inside of me. It's called my spirit. You can cut me open, you can't see it, it's, it's invisible. The Bible says twice, God is, God is invisible, the invisible God. That's supernatural. All this stuff here I'm showing you, it's wonderful. It's wonderful, you see. God is revealing this in the last days. These are the last days. This is for your preparation. Prepare yourself to meet the Lord. He's going to come suddenly. He's not going to announce and say, oh, hey, I'm going to come out and meet you. Uh, he's going to be attached to us suddenly. He's on his way down now. We can't see him. He's invisible too. Our word on our way up. How are we going up? Revelation upon revelation upon revelation. That's, that's, that's Jacob's ladder. Remember it had rungs on it leading up to, leading up to heaven? Revelation upon revelation upon revelation. That's what, how we're getting closer and closer and closer to God. And God's coming. Jesus is coming down. That's the same thing that happened to, to the... Uh, what was it? Uh, I'm not talking to the... Uh, I, no, it's the uh, uh, angel that... Uh, uh, the angel that wasted all his money in righteous living. Uh, what do we call that in the Bible? The righteous living guy? The prodigal son. Yeah, prodigal son, remember in the prodigal son it says this part, this part, that when he was in the pig pen and doing all the garbage that he was doing, the drugs and alcohol and, and, and lying and cheating and stealing that my staff is doing and everybody else is doing too, okay? When all that stuff he's doing, he, he came to himself, something came to himself, he realized and he stood up. And then he said, I will go to my father and confess my sins and ask to be reinstated. Reinstated again, because he was an angel, he fell, and now he's going to be, has to be reinstated again, be restored. I will go to my father, confess my sins, and be restored. Okay, and what happened? Well, he said that, nothing happened. But then, and he went. The Bible says, and look, you know what happened? Immediately, as he took his first step forward, Father God started coming back to him, coming down to him, and it says that God came ran to him, uh, came down to him as he was going up, as he was going up. He, Father God came down and put his arms around him and ran him and kissed him and hugged him. You see, God is just waiting for you to take that first step toward him. He's waiting for you to take that first step of confession, saying, Lord, Father, I confess I'm a sinner. He, if you wait that first step, he comes back to you. He's waiting for you now. He's not coming to you now and say person. But as soon as you take the first step and show your intention is real and you really start doing it, he will come. He's waiting for you, every one of you. John 3.3 3 says this, Jesus Christ says, except a man be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Except a man be born again, what does that mean? Romans 10.9 tells us that this is what it means, that if you will confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus, just like 
this prodigal son did, confess he's, he's a sinner. If you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in your heart that God hath raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. That means that you believe that Jesus Christ paid the penalty for all your sins. You're willing to believe that. If you do that, you should be saved, born again. Now, if you don't want to believe that Jesus paid for all your sins, well, then you've got to pay. It's up to you. Somebody's going to pay. Somebody's going to, somebody's sinned. You've broken God's laws. Either you pay the price or Jesus, up to you. Which do you prefer? So I ask you now, how you get saved is you ask Jesus Christ to be your Lord and Savior. I have a prayer that I say. I'm going to say that now. If you'd like to receive Jesus as your Lord and Savior, please raise your hand. And we're going to all say it, but I want to see someone who would like to, yes. Would you like to receive Jesus Christ for the first time? What's your name? Huh? Parents. Okay. What's this? This is for the first time or for, it is? So will you two stand, please? Harry and Claire. Got that? Okay, good. Now I'm going to say a prayer, and I'm going to ask all the people in the internet congregation if they'd like to receive Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior, that they can say it as well with us. And you who are all angels, I ask you to please stand with me and say the prayer with me. We can't uh, get re-saved again, because once you're saved, you're always saved. But what we are doing is we're confessing, we're, uh, we're just leading these people to the Lord, to the door of heaven, and they're going to walk through it. Harry and Faith? Claire. Okay. Okay, let's say this all together, shall we? Father God, I confess I'm a sinner. Please forgive me. I believe that Jesus Christ died on the cross and paid the penalty for all my sins and was resurrected. Thank you, Lord. Father God, please send your son, your seed, your love into my heart to be the Lord and Savior of my life. Father God. Amen. Amen, amen, amen. Thank you all. Please be seated. Hallelujah. Please be seated. We're going to take uh, tithes and offerings now and uh, take the mask off. Okay. And I want you up on this side over here. Why do we take tithes and offerings from a whole bunch of poor people? Because we want you to be blessed. And that's what the tithes and offerings are. That's a blessing. In addition to hearing the word of God, which you have today, you're to be blessed because God said, return to me. He didn't say give to me of your tithes. He said return to me of your tithes, which means that the assumption that he's given you everything that you have, he's asking for you to sacrifice something back to him, something that's dear to you. That would be your tithe, okay? And if you do that, God said, I will open the windows of heaven above you so that you cannot contain the blessings that will flow down upon you. So that's a pretty good deal because you become one of God's children, one of God's obedient children. Now, it doesn't mean uh, just because you don't tithe doesn't mean you can't go to heaven, but do you want to go to heaven as a, as a disobedient child or as an obedient child? What do you, which one do you think is going to get the most blessings? You want to do it like that. I mean, you bless the obedient, right? You don't bless the disobedient. Oh, you've been really good. Have some ice cream, pop it in, I'll treat you. Forget that. Just bless the obedient children. God wants you to be obedient children. He wants you to be blessed. So Lord God, in the name of Jesus Christ, I do take these tithes and offerings. And I take this word, this word that you delivered today, Lord, to us. For our blessing, for our blessing, each and every one here, I ask that you be blessed more and more. In the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior, amen. Richard, would you stand and bless the food we're about to partake of? Do it loud, though, so we can hear you. He can't speak loud, but it's okay. <laughs> hey, bless the food. God bless you all. All right, have a nice time. Come next week if we're still here. If we haven't been translated up by then, which might happen in a day, just be ready. It's all going to come as a big surprise. Yeah. Thank you.
Okay, remember, I need to talk to you. I'm ready. All right? Oh, I, bless I, you. I, I should you stand up now. I, I, I can't stand yeah. right. Yeah. You had a big surgery. Yeah. <laughs>